Without further ado, let us put our hands together to welcome Prof Tan to share more about our undergraduate curriculum. Prof Tan, please. Thank you. Hi. Uh, morning, everyone. So, uh, welcome, everyone. So, thanks for joining us in a rainy morning. And welcome to my colleagues and also alumni of our folks, CBC. So, my name is Hao Xiang. So, I've been tasked to kind of like introduce a little bit about NTU chemistry to you guys. Okay? So, um, I am an associate professor and I teach physical chemistry at NTU. And of course, like uh, 30 of you guys here, thanks for coming. And of course, welcome to also to the probably, I don't know, 50 people, 60 people that, that's online watching it right now. So, without further ado, um, I'm just going to show you the next slide. So, what are we? So, I'm going to just introduce what do we do in chemistry. So, basically, we are a group of people, a whole collection, a family of people that are very interested in things that is molecular. Anything that's molecular, we are interested. That's what chemists do. And we are interested in figuring out the whys, the what, the how, and the what for of all these molecular stuff. To put in more like number, more quantitative um, uh, aspect, we are founded in 2005. That's a good 16 years ago. Um, and we are now a, flat, a big family of uh, currently, of course, like um, just uh, currently about 800 undergraduates, about 200 per year. Um, almost 100 PhD and master student, postgraduate students helping out in research. 31 faculty members, that is professors, associate professors, lecturers, and so on and so forth. Um, and about 80 research staffs and 13 admin staff that's running the whole show of the school. So, each, how it's function like is like um, the main business of our uh, unit chemistry is to do education and research, right? So, um, we, I'll tell you a bit more uh, uh, details about that. So, what is the business of us chemistry at, at NTU? Right, so, Essentially, one of the main reasons why we are there is uh, the main job of the faculty members, the 30-odd faculty members, is to do research, meaning pushing the frontier of the knowledge of uh, our knowledge of the external world, of why molecules are there, how reactions go, what are the materials made out of, why these things happen, and, and, and so on and so forth. The fundamental science of the molecules. Right? But at the same time, there are also external challenges and problems of the society that we are very much aware of and want to contribute to help improve the society, uh, pushing the knowledge of what we know about materials and you know, uh, obtaining uh, you know, better outcomes for a lot of challenges in this new uh, century, right? such as sustainable development. All these challenges you're probably very well aware of. Sustainable development, clean energy, all these things that has been on forefront the long ago, maybe it will impact your generation, definitely, maybe the next generation, so and so forth. And of course, right now, very relevant health and disease cures with the COVID-19 floating around still. Um, all these things are like a feedback loop, right, that we do push the frontiers of science, but at the same time, look out for these problems and help to say, uh, uh, solve them and it's a feedback loop, right? So that's the environment that we have in NTU chemistry, set up to do this. At the same time, the other pillar of the very important uh, goal, the business of what we are doing is educating the next batch of chemists for Singapore, for the world, all right? So that's where you guys may come in, all right? You know, like um, right smack in this environment to be educated so that you can, you know, be involved in this whole endeavor. So with this kind of um, uh, background, I'm going to just, just tell you a little bit more about more of the in-depth, interesting stuff that we do in chemistry in terms of research. Right? Then I'll move on uh, from there. Um, and then later on, my colleague uh, Sumot will tell you a little bit more about uh, the more kind of academic details of, the, of things. So I'll go off by talking about uh, you know, something that is right at, you know, like um, in a sense very relevant to us because of COVID-19 and just appeared on the news. So I'll introduce my colleague here, Associate Professor Ling Xingyi, who happens to be also the head of chemistry. Um, she's a, uh, a specialist in nanochemistry. So what are the things that she does? 
is that she specializes in making nanoparticles of all sorts of shapes, very small, but all sorts of different shapes, cube stars, what, what not, anything you want, she probably can make it, or her students can make it. And her specialization is how to then use this for the good of mankind and, you know, or earn, to earn money or whatever, right? So, so things like that can be applied to, for example, for anti-counterfeiting uh, applications, right? You can implant all these small little things into maybe a next generation of banknotes to prevent um, um, counterfeiting because they have very distinct spectral uh, features that cannot be faked, right? Um, more recently, this is, uh, well, one year or almost one year ago, uh, she used this kind of technology to actually increase the um, detectivity of some of the comp uh, some, some kind of comp compounds in urine that can actually I identify, for example, like pregnancy outcome, you know, for miscarriages. So very, very useful in medical sciences. But actually, much more recently, uh, this is you can see, it's April 20th, a couple of days ago. You may have seen in the news of uh, uh, this this company called Silver Factory, which is actually co-owned by him and his group, uh, his PhD student, who uh, ex PhD student now the you know like uh, running the running the factory there called Silver Factory, using this kind of silver nanomet nanomaterial based surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy to actually aid in, uh, in non-invasive detection of COVID-19, right? So now, nowadays you use PCR, that's the ultimate test, right? This is almost as good as the PCR, but no need to draw anything from your body. You just breathe it in and you can detect um, uh, some of the molecules that's like associated with COVID-19 to allow you to have a positive test. You have or do you do not have you can see the, you know, uh, the, the usefulness of these things. And these things are actually cheaper than the PCR. So you can read more about this in a couple of days of uh, old news only. So that's some examples of how, you know, in, in, in chemistry, we have this fundamental research and how it then, when opportunity arise, contribute back to society. Um, another example here, so we have uh, my colleague Hansen here. He specializes in inorganic chemistry, right? Very fundamental chemistry kind of uh, branch, you, you all know that chemistry is typically divided into inorganic, organic, physical, analytical, right? So this is the example of in, inorganic. He specializes in making uh, inorganic molecules and he basically had this idea that, um, you know, in terms of trying to solve for like sustainable energy and stuff like that, he was thinking, problem, plastic, how do we get rid of plastic? And he was thinking, there's another problem that, how do we get clean energy? Then he hit upon this idea sometime that, oh, why don't I use the sun somehow could make this kind of like photocatalysis catalyst that can allow me to break down the plastic right so that it can be disposed of but at the same time it's just not just break down and then uh, dispose of these are broke down into molecules that we need right fuels and then can fuel, feed the fuel cell so solving two problems in one go killing two birds in one using one stone so that's the kind of thinking that we have fundamental chemistry inorganic trying to see where it, where it fits in in the new 21st century. Uh, another example here, my uh, colleague, Peng Kang, he specialized in biological chemistry right, or chemical biology. So he uses his, his powers in synthetic chemistry to make molecules that blink, okay, that blink, that can light up like cancer cells. So that, you know, you, you have a, one big problem of medical science is like, how do you know you got cancer or not, right? So one thing is that he can make molecules that can only stick to cancer cells and light up, and when you, um, uh, you try to detect it, it lights up, and you know there's cancer there. And of course, there are other things. It's like you can, you can make medicine that is linked to light-activated molecules that will release very targeted medicine at specific locations. Things like that, application of chemical biology to medical sciences. Um, another colleague of mine, Chiba, he, he specialized in making crazily complicated molecules. Um, so how, what, what's, you know, how, that, how is it relevant to real life? He can, some of these ways that he make, new ways of synthetic uh, organic chemistry, so he's an organic chemist uh, in synthesis. Uh, how do you make anti-cancer drugs easily, right? Uh, he has collaboration with Pfizer and so on and so forth to do all these things. Um, of course, we, in our research, it's, it's not just all, okay, um, uh, you know, some, all the sciences must find some application. In, 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 in industry or relevant to some kind of like society needs. There's a whole spectrum of research from the more fundamental, we just want to understand what is in nature to the more research, uh, for more applied stuff, okay? So, so 
uh, in the branch of physical chemistry, so my, my, my colleague here, Zhen Yang, who, who's sitting around here later, you can talk to him if you're interested in what he's doing. Um, he specialized in this field called super microscopy. In other words, he can look at things that nobody can uh, magnify and, and see. And these, so he uses these to actually look, these methods to actually look at industrial chemistry processes to really look at the uh, uh, details of uh, chemical reaction important for industry. And um, I'll round off this research part by talking about Zheng. So this is really fundamental. Essentially, right now, no applications to industry yet, right? He is currently in his lab, has the fastest camera in Singapore. What do you mean by that? His laser system is so short, it's like four femtoseconds long. He can take snapshots of chemical uh, dynamics as it happens. Over here, what you're seeing is actually, you, you guys expert in chemistry, you probably know S and P orbitals, right? When you excite a molecule, the electrons move around. So they basically morph from a P orbital to S orbital and float back to P orbital. He can actually see it, right? This rigorous that we see here. And also how the electrons flow around in the water molecules, things like that. So hopefully give you a flavor of the, the interesting stuff that we do. So where do you guys come in? Well, these are basically the skeletal, your first year, second year, third year, fourth year, right? But in between, to get our undergrads to be basically started off to um, doing research part of this culture, is that we have various opportunity. Usually, like, in typically, you people have to think about final year project. But even that, be, before the, beyond that, uh, we have summer research where you can start, you know, making mistakes in doing research already when you're in your first year. During what well, we call summer year, although this is a misnomer, is during your June holidays in between first year and second year. You can do that. There's also for good students, you have this thing called Eureka as well as um, Odyssey program, which is especially, I'll, I'll flash a slide later on to talk about that, a special program only in SPMS that we cater to people who really like sciences. And of course, there's also this CN Young program, which I'm sure some of you, uh, you know, knows about it and has been invited for this uh, interview. So there's a multiple opportunities overlapping uh, that you can actually make use of to get yourself into this environment of um, scholarship and research, if, you are, if that's what you want. Um, that's this Odyssey program uh, that we specially catered for, you know, undergraduates and provide them with all the, it basically is, you know, put it in a more like layman language, it's nerd club. Like, if you're really liking all this kind of intellectual stuff, that's a good place to be, right? You, you will put you guys together so that you can have a social group to actually, you know, talk to each other about science and whatnot. Um, Okay, so basically, uh, the take-home message is that we, we, we don't just want to train students that go out and get a chemistry job. It's not just so simple, right? It's not just training students to have a job in chemistry next time. We actually want our students to exit with a, you know, education that will train them with a life in chemistry. And I don't mean just job, you know, because a lot of our students will not end up doing um, research or, or work in the lab. But as you see uh, later on, uh, some alumni who are in science, but not in the lab. Spec There's a lot of other things like policy, or even if you are next time you become a millionaire, you will need chemistry knowledge for certain things. Right? All these things, that's what I meant, a life in chemistry. So you approach whatever outcome later on what you do in life, right? you will be looking things through a molecular perspective. Right? So for example, like even now, like, like relevant example, COVID-19. Now when you Think about COVID-19, a chemistry, if you're like living kind of, you're a chemist, not just for your job, but you think chemically, you think, okay, what is this? Then you, 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 you can understand all those, how the spike of the coronavirus, how does it invade us? And then you, if you're trying to explain to other people, you understand how to actually relate all these real life problems to other people through a uh, molecular point of view. So that's what we aim to do, right? So in this, uh, you know, in our whole uh, education system. Um, okay, so uh, just to round up, I know my, I'm now having negative three minutes left. Um, that, um, yeah, so that, like uh, the, the president flashed out some numbers for you to tell, to convince you that we're pretty good. And I'm just going to flash up some more numbers. These are basically the rankings, uh, not according to us, but according to other people's like you know, US News, like QS rankings, Shanghai, and how good we are uh, in chemistry, not just the universe, but chemistry specific, the rankings that we have. I'll just show, this, this is actually the US news. That's where the undergraduates uh, in US go to look at, you know, figure out which university they want to go to. 
right after they take their SAT and go to which university. Uh, so they also have a ranking for international university and uh, to our surprise, uh, NTU is actually ranked fourth in terms of chemistry. Okay, so that's a uh, very uh, nice news for us. Um, these are the ranking uh, also within the top 10. So tied together with our uh, uh, wonderful uh, partner, not partner university, brother university in Singapore. Um, and uh, this is actually another, this is Shanghai ranking, a Chinese ranking. Uh, we are ranked 10 among the you know, other well-known universities you can see here. And this is the one, this ranking is called Nature Index. This is basically purely just research. How good your publication, your research, uh, they basically rank those top publications, high impact in science. Uh, and we're ranked uh, top 20, pretty good. Uh, you know, slightly ahead of uh, some other university in Singapore. So um, I think with that, I will end my talk. And I just want to let you know that, you know, uh, to, when you are with us, the, the whole thing is to stay curious and hungry. And uh, yeah, hopefully you will enjoy the rest of the day. And with that, I will pass back the mic to the to, to, to. Hey. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Prof Tan, for sharing with us, uh, sharing with us what uh, what we do in CBC and also um, what chemistry entails. Yeah. So it's not every day that you have a undergraduate curriculum that involves a lot of research um, activities, as you can see just now. We have summer research. We have Eureka. So many opportunities. Yeah, it's very rare. Very interesting. Okay, uh, so next up, uh, let's invite uh, Deputy Head of Division Academics uh, for CBC, Dr. Sumat, to share more about our undergraduate curriculum. Dr. Sumat, please. Hi, uh, everyone. Welcome to everyone. Everyone who has come here, taken the effort to come here in person, and also to the large number of people who are joining us online. Uh, so my colleague, uh, Hao Xiang has already covered the research part. So what I would like to do today is to give you a brief overview of our curriculum, the academic part. Although both are quite intertwined, right? You can't have the curriculum part and you can't have purely the research. So we'll try to blend both together. So let me take you through the curriculum that we have lined up for you in the Bachelor of Science in Chemistry Honors Program that we have, okay? So these are the key programs that we have, right? So uh, the one that you see here, uh, that is our flagship program. It's the basic BSc chemistry and biological chemistry uh, honors year program, four year direct honors, okay? So that's our flagship program. Uh, so you can opt for either that or you can opt for any of these three, what we call second major. So. The second major program, how it works, is that you take all the courses that are part of the BSc Chemistry, Biological Chemistry flagship program, and on top of that, you get trained in a specialized area, right? So we have, so aside from the main program, we have these three, and these three are carefully crafted. These are crafted for areas which are, uh, which will equip our graduates for the future. So you can see by the themes of the three program, that they are really targeted at the future to equip you as a future graduate for the market, the job market, right? So the newest program that we have, which is actually starting off with your batch, the current incoming academic batch, uh, the newest second major program is a one in uh, business and international trading. So this is run in collaboration with two partners in NTU. The first one is the Nanyang Business School, which I think most of you will know is one of the top business schools in the Asia Pacific region and in the world, right? So we run that program in collaboration with the Nanyang Business School, as well as the Center for Excellence in International Trading, right? So that's the two partners involved in the second major in international trading. We have another second major, which is in food science and technology, right? Again, you can see the emphasis is on things, uh, areas which are uh, high growth currently and are things that which will become more and more important in the future, okay? Uh, this is run in collaboration with a few schools in NTU. It's a joint program, as well as an international partner, which is a Wagenagen University in the Netherlands. So the Wagenagen University in the Netherlands is one of the world leaders in food science and technology. So we are partnered with the best to offer you this program 
in food science and technology. So that's the other second major. And the third second major is the one in environmental science. So I think I don't need to emphasize to you guys the importance of this area again, once again, right? It's current, it's uh, future relevant, okay? And uh, this is run in collaboration with the Asian School of Environment in NTU uh, and the School of Civil and Environmental Engineering, right? So what these partners bring in into this program is their own uh, core expertise in the area. So which means that when you take these second major programs, you take courses from these partner universities or partner uh, schools in NTU, okay? So that makes the program very, very uh, specialized and the training that you get is really top notch, okay? Right. So uh, what I'll do now is, I, I don't want to bore you with too much details of what are the courses you take in every year, but I just want to give you a brief overview of what are the things that you learn every year and how our curriculum is structured. So in the first year, what you do is that you have these basic courses which covers the key areas of chemistry with a little bit of mathematics and physics and a tinge of computational thinking and artificial intelligence. These are things that is needed in the future, right? So you start getting immersed in this right from the year one of your study, okay? Uh, so you take things like basic biochemistry, organic chemistry. So these are, these are really basic level courses. The intention of this is twofold. One is that to make sure that everyone in the class is to the same level with regards to the basic knowledge. Also, we also bear in mind that some of our students are coming back from national service, right? You might have forgotten a little bit of your, the, base, the things that you learned earlier. So it, this first year courses basically allow you to catch up on that to make sure your fundamental knowledge of everyone in the class is to the same level before you go on to the second year, okay? Uh, I'll touch a, touch a little bit upon other things that are covered in the first year in my subsequent slide. So that is roughly the idea of first year. And then you go on to your second year, you learn intermediate courses in the various fields. You can start taking electives, which I will mention later, what are the electives available. And in the third year, you go for more advanced courses. So uh, these are not just the number of courses that you take each year, okay? This is just representing the, the areas under which you take the various courses, right? So the number of courses that you take are much more than this. And uh, in your final year, you take higher level specialized courses. Along with, you have an option to do either an industrial attachment uh, or a final year research project. Right? So this option is available to you. You can go for an industrial attachment to get industry specific training, or you can stay back with us, like what my colleague, uh, Prof. Hao Xiang mentioned. You can stay back with us, join one of the research groups which are working in the leading cutting edge areas of chemistry, and do your final year project with us in one of the research teams. So that option is available to you in the final year, okay? And, uh, there are opportunities for research in the summer, like uh, my colleague mentioned just now, the summer research program, where you get an opportunity to, you know, join a research group and try out research in between uh, your curriculum. Yeah, so other than the core courses that you take, the main courses you take, you also have a set of courses which are called prescribed electives. So these, again, as you can see, are courses which are uh, tailor-made and which are targeted at special key upcoming areas in chemistry to make sure that you're up to date with all the current developments in the realm of chemical science, okay? So for example, you can take, depending on your interest, some of the prescribed electives will be like pharmaceutical chemistry, analytical chemistry, advanced analytical chemistry, uh, nanoscience, artificial intelligence, uh, metal mediated reactions, right? And also things like biomedical imaging. So this, this is not the full list, by the way. This is just a short summary of some of the prescribed electives that you can take um, after you have finished your core uh, courses. Along with them, you can take these courses, okay? And then you have deepening electives, uh, which in, again in areas which are current, materials, polymer, industrial and environmental chemistry, drug design, food analysis, and safety. So even if you are not in one of our second major programs, you can still take the food-related food courses. So, uh, I mentioned to you we have a second major in food science. So those of you who are not in that second major, you can still take these courses in food science, right? 
so you don't miss out. Uh, and of course, uh, NTU, the curriculum allows you to take a wide range of what is called broadening electives, which means that you can take anything that it is your pet second passion. We hope that your primary passion is chemistry, but if you have a second passion, maybe you learn a new language, Japanese, for example, you can take that under the broadening electives. So it's a very holistic uh, curriculum, which allows you the flexibility to pursue certain areas of your interest while ensuring that you are training and you are equipped at the core uh, competencies in chemical science, right? We also have, kicking off from this academic year, actually, like you saw in the president's address, we have what is called the Interdisciplinary Collaborative Core. These are courses which are taken by every student in NTU, irrespective of what uh, program they are pursuing, right? And the aim of these courses is, it's, as you see, it's a common university-wide core, seven courses which are focusing on transferable skills and what is considered as grand challenges. So transferable skills are things like entrepreneurship, uh, digital literacy, uh, and ethics and civics, and then also things like uh, sustainability. So under grand challenges, we have sustainability and uh, areas which are, we think, all graduates, irrespective of which discipline they are, uh, should have, right? So these courses you take in your first two years along with your chemistry courses, right? Uh, and it's taken by everybody in the, in the NTU, and this makes sure that we graduate well-rounded individuals, not just graduates who are very good in that particular discipline, but well-rounded individuals who have the soft skills, who have the transferable skills, uh, so that they are equipped for the workplace of tomorrow. That, that is the, so this kicks in from this academic year, just when you are uh, joining, okay? Uh, you can choose a minor, right? So if you're choosing a second major, you can't have a minor, but if you're flagship program, the main BSc chemistry, you can choose to do a minor, and your minor can be in any of the areas that um, NTU offers. It can be as wide as, you know, in economics, in business, in mathematics, physics, even in life science, psychology. You can do a minor by doing a certain number of courses, right? Uh, of course, if you're doing a second major, you don't have an option of doing a minor, okay? Because the second major curriculum is already quite intense. Uh, this is the one in second major in food science and technology. I will not go through the grade out area, basically means that it is the areas which is common with our flagship BSc uh, honors, the basic program, right? So if you are in the food science and technology second major, you do additional courses in these areas that I mentioned. For example, food physics, uh, food process engineering, food microbiology, food chemistry, etc. And uh, your industrial attachment and your final year project will also be in that related area. So that is the second major in food science and technology, the run, one we run with Waganagan. Uh, similar structure. You get to do a summer exchange program at Waganagan University under this second major. Okay? And this is the one in environmental science. Again, you can see that the ones in green are the courses or the roughly the areas in which you take courses which are related to environmental science, uh, like uh, biosphere, climate change, sustainability, and stuff like that. And of course, your final year project, again, will be in a relevant area to your second major. Okay, uh, this is the newest program we have, which is the one in uh, business and international trading. The aim of this program is basically to generate graduates who have a good foundation in chemistry and chemical science knowledge, but who also have competencies in business. So the kind of jobs that we envision for graduates from this program is that you head a business division in a company which deals with chemical, chemicals, fine chemicals, and petrochemicals maybe. So you have a expertise in both areas, and you will be valuable to the firm because of your um, broad expertise. Uh, that you take in this second major, apart from the core courses in chemistry, uh, things like uh, commodities, markets, management, accounting, business accounting, uh, international trade, and stuff like that. Uh, they also involve some overseas learning programs, which are incorporated into this, as well as the usual uh, final year project. 
Now, uh, we also have internships. So research uh, is research opportunities I mentioned already, but apart from that, you also have opportunities to do internship. So every student who is going to do the final year research project, right? Uh, if you are doing the final year research project, we want you to also have some exposure to an industrial internship environment, the real working world environment. So if you are going to do an FYP in your final year, instead of an industrial internship in your final year, uh, you still get to do what is called a professional attachment in a company for 10 weeks, right? So you have the best of both worlds. You have your research, intense training in research from summer research, Eureka, and all the programs that my colleague mentioned, as well as the final year project, but you still have some industrial uh, experience. So you have the best of both in your CV when you graduate. Of course, those who choose to go to the internship route, uh, they will do a more intensive 20-week internship, which is called a professional internship in the final year. But you can choose which route to follow. Okay? So this is for the final year research project route. You take the 10-week program internship. If you choose to do the professional internship, then you directly do the final 20 weeks intensive internship in your final year. Uh, these are some of the companies where we, our students intern, and you can see that these are all you know, top companies where our career attachment office will help to place you. Okay? We also have something called a cooperative education program. Uh, I won't mention too much in detail. It's a specialized one. You can find a lot of details about this on our website. This is a, the difference of this internship program with the normal one is that you spend uh, almost 50 weeks in the same company throughout your four years of study with us. So it's a long-term internship. And it's for a selected small group of students uh, who will be placed with our industrial partners, some of whom are listed here. Okay. The final year project I will not touch upon because Prof. Uh, Siang has already mentioned. Uh, you can do it in a wide range of areas. We have over 30 faculty working in various areas of chemical science. You can choose to do your final year project in anywhere. We also have, okay, this is an optimistic slide in some ways because we hope that you will, by the time you are, you guys are in your second or third year, you will get to do an overseas exchange program, right? Uh, so it's a pessimistic, I mean, it's, it, it's an optimistic outlook. Uh, we have collaborations with a, lot, a significant number of top universities across the world, not only in the Asia, but also in Europe and in the U.S., so you can choose to do a one semester of exchange overseas, and you can transfer some of the credits for the courses you took overseas to fulfill your requirement for your bachelor program, right? That will be all. Um, I know that I've skipped through quite fast. If you need more in-depth information, of course, you can go to our website, and you can find details like what are the exact courses that you take, right? What are the topics that are covered by the courses? Uh, this information you can find on our website, so I hope you, that will help you. And uh, later on at the question and answer session, I'll be happy to answer any of the queries that you will have regarding our program. So basically you can see that the theme of our curriculum is to give you a very solid theoretical uh, knowledge in chemical science, in the wide realm of chemical science. So chemical science extends all the way from, you know, things like analytical chemistry, materials, biochemistry. So it's very wide, right? Uh, so our curriculum is aimed to give you a strong foundation in that area, along with hands-on experience in terms of final year projects and internships, right? So uh, thank you once again for coming here, and uh, I'll be happy to take your questions later during the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sumot, for the very clear introduction to CVC. Uh, I believe that after hearing what Dr. Sumot has said, uh, shared with us, we are more uh, assured, but at the same time, we are excited. So um, next on, we have um, Associate Professor Lee Hyang Kui, who will be sharing with us about his cutting-edge research in chemistry, nanotechnology, and also material science. Whoa! So let's welcome Professor Lee. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Daryl. So, whoa, yes. So, I'm not an assistant 
associate professor. Right now, I'm assistant professor. Of, okay. So my name is Xiangkui, and today I will be here to share about nanomaterial research at NTU Chemistry. So to begin, I would like to briefly introduce myself. So I got my PhD and bachelor degree in chemistry from NTU in 2018 and 2013, respectively. After which I went to Stanford University for two years to do my postdoc training. So at the last year, I returned to Singapore and joined NTU Chemistry as a faculty. So my research interest lies in the development of designing of novel nano particles as well as developing hybrid nanoparticles, investigating into the fundamental science and chemistry behind their unique properties, as well as further applying them to address key scientific challenges in energy, environment, and molecular sensing. So what do we exactly do, at, do for nanomaterial research? So basically, we are dealing with materials that is at the nanometer regime. All right, so this is basically one million times smaller than our, the thickness of our, I mean the diameter of our human hair, and it is definitely smaller compared to red blood cell, bacteria, and virus. So it is only slightly bigger than atoms. So if you cannot still visualize what is nanometer, I believe everyone has watched Ant-Man. Anyone has not watched Ant-Man? Okay. Okay, so for Ant-Man, this is from Marvel, so he can be a grown-up man like us, all right? So he can also string himself down to the nanometer or even quantum levels. So at this level, even particles or bacteria is much significantly bigger than him, right? So at this regime, he is able to interact with this nanomaterial and manipulate them. So for nanomaterial research, we want to be like Ant-Man. Okay, we want to deal with chemistry at the nanometer or molecular level. But sadly, we are not end men and we cannot string ourselves. So that is why we want to design nanomaterials to manipulate molecules and even lights at the nanometer scales. Right, so one example is that we can design nanomaterials with predefined structural properties or chemical properties so that we are able to manipulate or predefine how molecules can interact with each other to drive the reaction. So this is what we call nanocatalysis. So another unique properties at uh, the nanometer regime is that there is unique light matter interaction. So for instance, in a light cookers cup, so this is a classic example. So for gold, we know that it's shiny yellow. For silver, it's silver. All right. So but can you imagine that gold or silver can be red or green? It's hard to imagine. So that is only when these particles are at the nanometer size. So for instance, for the Likerkus cup, when we shine light onto it, it appears as green. But if we, we were to put the light source inside this cup, it would be green, eh? it would be red, sorry. So, we, so from this, we can see that materials are definitely unique at the nanometer size. So in this sharing session, I would just like to share one of my first few uh, research work that I did for my PhD studies. So for this work, I'm mainly preparing plasmonic liquid marble for as a miniature platform for analytical application. So liquid marble are basically 3D structures comprising of a liquid core and a shell composed of silver nanoparticles or any nano or micro-sized particle. So for our work, what we use is uh, our building block is silver nanocubes because it can exhibit unique light matter interaction. So this can further amplify the electric field very near to this surface and therefore boost detection sensitivity. So we can prepare our plasmonic liquid marble simply by rolling a very small micro droplet around three microliter on a bit of pulverized silver nanocube. So this is what we get. So this is very small around one to two millimeter. So our plasmonic liquid marble is spherical. There is no interaction with the underlying substrate, that is, it can easily roll on hydrophilic cells. So this is, in fact, very difficult because water will interact with glass and it will just stick there as a spot, right? Okay, so our plasmonic liquid marble is also very robust, but it can bounce on solid surfaces, even when clustered at uh, elevated height of 1 cm. So another important point is that it can interact with water and also non-polar solvent, whereby it can float on top of water and submerge into organic solvent. 
So this creates opportunities for interfacial application involving multiple phases. Okay, so one of the potential applications that we did is we subsequently apply our plasmonic liquid marble for ultra trace and quantitative multiplex sensing across multiple interface or phases. So firstly, for our first example, we place our analyte, which is a dye molecule inside the aqueous core. So we are able to get a vibrational fingerprint unique to each chemical. So through the intensity of this vibrational fingerprint, we can quantify the amount of analyte or molecules inside our water. So we can detect down to the femto mole level. So this is in fact very trace or ultra trace. So similarly, we can place our analytes at the exterior organic phase like this. And similarly, we can obtain very trace kind of detection. So if we can detect molecules inside the aqueous phase and also at the outside organic phase, we can surely do concurrent detection of both aqueous and organic phases. So we did multiplex sensing by putting our analyze in aqueous phase and also in a organic phase. So we are able to quantify or tally them, all right, compared to their individual detection. So what does this imply? So right now we are able to make possible the concurrent detections in oil and aqueous phases without the need to separate them. So as we know in the industry, we cannot quantify them concurrently, we need to separate them into oil and water so that they will not interfere with each other. So this creates opportunities whereby we can shorten the processing time and to concurrently detect different types of analytes. So after which we also expanded the applications of uh, plasmonic liquid marble. So firstly, we use it for interfacial detection. We also can use it for in situ reaction monitoring. That is, we were to understand, that is, we can understand the fundamental chemistry or the mechanism behind different reactions. So we are able to get the mechanism and also the dynamic of different reactions. So we can also use it as a microchemical plant. So we mimic the actual industry whereby we combine different reactants together for reaction. Then we quantify QC them. Then we do our next step again and QC them again. All right. So we also achieved the world's smallest 3D spectroelectrochemical reactor. That is, we are able to do electrochemistry while observing the uh, chemical footprint at the molecular level. Right, so we have done a lot of research and we do it not just for fun. All right? Of course, we have fun doing our research, but what we want is that through this research, we can translate them into useful application, all right, so that we can contribute to the society and most importantly, we can earn money. All right, so this is a picture of the CBC lab. So I believe Prof Tan has already shown you. So very clean, very new. So this is a lab that you want to be in, right? So this is my PhD advisor. He is my PhD co-advisor. Uh, co and this is my junior. All right, so right now they have co-founded uh, co this company known as a Silver Factory Technology. And from this image, what can you see? Anyone? All right, so from this image, I can see that if you want to be a co-founder of some company, you got to join NTU, all right? So the next, when you join NTU, you got to join NTU, okay? So if are already inside NTU chemistry, do participate actively in research so that you can contribute to the science and ultimately be a co-founder yourself. All right, so that's a lot of hard selling. Yeah, so right now they are working on this very important technology, which they call it the non-invasive COVID-19 detection using breath. So to me, this is very important because I have done the swab test it's so invasive that I almost cried, okay? Anyone has done the swab test? No. So do you cry? Yes, <laughs> yeah. So one yes, one no. All right, so I'm not afraid of neither, and I can tahan through all the blood tests, but swab test is really a terrible experience for me. So I hope that their technology will work and be commercialized very soon. 
All right, so right now there is a promotional video of which can be a preview of what we are going to commercialize hopefully very soon. All right, so this is around two minutes, so sit back and relax. At the registration station, passengers scan a QR code to fill in their details and obtain a personalized passenger QR code. Passengers move to the breathalyzer station, where an operator will scan the passenger QR code, retrieve the passenger's details, and verify them against the passenger's passport. Operator scans and pairs a new breathalyzer's barcode with the passenger QR code. The breathalyzer is then passed to the passenger. Passenger will take out the breathalyzer and lock cap and blow into the breathalyzer for about 10 seconds. Passenger closes the breathalyzer with the lock cap and puts the breathalyzer into a tray. The passenger can now proceed to the verification station. At the analysis station, the operator disinfects the breathalyzer, scans the barcode, and puts the breathalyzer into the reader. With a single click, the breathalyzer is analyzed and the result is uploaded into the blockchain database. The analysis takes less than two minutes. When a passenger proceeds to the verification station, an operator will scan the passenger's QR code and verify his details. The operator retrieves the breath test result and directs the passenger to the exit. Alright, so this is the very spin-off from NTU Chemistry. So from what we can see that this is one classic, very good example of how we can translate fundamental research into a more, more commercializable technology. All right. Okay, so besides nanomaterial research, our NTU chemistry is in fact very strong in different other areas. For instance, we have created micro robots, which uh, I believe Professor Richard will be discussing. Yeah. So we are also very strong in synthetic chemistry. We have also some research working on food analysis, all right? So, of course, we have uh, Professor Lo who is looking at how chemistry oc occur at very short time frame in the femtosecond region. Yeah, so this is Professor Su who is working on plastic waste recovery. That is how I'm able to, to degrade plastic into useful chemicals. And this, again, was from my ex-PhD group so they are able to detect airborne chemicals from a safe uh, location that is using telescope from a uh, far place, right? So this is to keep you safe while detecting the molecular fingerprint at a safe distance. So with this, thank you. Right. Thank you, Prof Lee, for sharing with us how we can push the boundaries of knowledge through research. So although I'm currently doing Eureka uh, undergrad research, but you know, I get to co-found a company, but you know, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. Yeah. Um, let us invite the next speaker, Associate Professor Richard, Webster, uh, Richard Webster, who will be sharing with us more on his research topic, uh, environmental chemistry. Uh, Prof Webster, please. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I just quickly, I guess, introduce myself. I'm that work. I'm from uh, New Zealand originally, but I did my PhD in Australia, and I've been in Singapore now for 15 years. So I'm here almost from the beginning of when chemistry started. And my area of interest, or my research area, is analytical chemistry. Do I have to put... Oh, I've got the finger. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, so what is analytical chemistry? Anal analytical chemistry is actually the most probably industrially significant branch of chemistry and it's certainly the area where most students get jobs and I know that for a fact because I actually handle the professional internship program and most of the students who do that do go into analytical chemistry jobs. So it is the branch of chemistry as it says here that deals with the separation, identification and determination of components in the sample. So basically analytical chemistry you use to determine what something is made of, basically. That's one of the things it's used for. Um, and 
Another example is, is what we do is environmental chemistry. So if you want to know uh, what is in the water, for example, is the water safe to drink, you have to use analytical measurements. If you want to know what's in the air, what are the chemicals in the air, that's also analytical chemistry. And lots of um, important applications in industry, quality control, um, when you're making new samples, new materials, etc. And just to show you what the type of stuff I'm going to talk about today, it's on environmental type um, samples. And some of the measurements we do are on air quality, for example. We measure um, during, strictly during haze, when we have the haze from Indonesia, the burning, the biomass burning, we collect samples. These are actually undergraduate students there in that photo. And then we have, for example, during the Hungry Ghost Festival, also produces a lot of haze and other pollution. So we do measurements for that. We also do sampling overseas. I have projects in India, and this one's in Bhutan, where we collect water samples from the Himalayas, from the glacial mounts, and measure the pollution in those. Surprising, it's a very pristine area of the earth, but there is actually a lot of pollution being situated between China and India they experience a fair amount of pollution, which we can detect in the, even the pristine glacial water. We detect a lot of, um, not a lot, but we click detect certain pollutants. Uh, just what I'm gonna talk about now is just quickly about some stuff we do on air quality. And some of you might know the actual air quality index, the AQI. It's the, it was developed by the US EPA in America, and it's supposed to give you an indication of the major pollutants and the severity of the pollution. Singapore uses a different scale. It's, we use the PSI scale. PSI scale is just an older version of the AQI scale. For some reason, Singapore did not go. Every other country in the world changed from the PSI to the AQI, except Singapore, which kept the PSI. But it doesn't make a huge difference because you get similar levels of pollution if you use the two scales. Actually, the PSI gives the impression that the air is a bit better compared to the AQI. That's possibly why we use the PSI. But the major pollutants that we measure are the sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxides, ozone and carbon monoxide. These are all gases. And then a one that people can see that they think they worry about the most is the particulate matter, which is the PM10 or the PM2.5. And these are the little particles that float around in the, in the air. Um, this is actually the AQI scale here. Uh, these are actually, this is actually, this column here shows the concentration of the particles, so how much there are in the air, and it's usually measured in these units of micrograms per meter cubed. So it's relatively small amounts. So, and these are the AQI scale that corresponds to that. So as the particles increase, of course, the amount of the AQI scale, AQI scale also increases. Okay, so basically it gets, seems to get worse. So essentially the more particles in the air, the worse the scale, worse the effect. And interesting thing with the scale is that I often ask people, how do you think that compares to, for example, a cigarette? So in Singapore, about the worst it ever gets is between three and 400 micrograms per meter cubed, which is similar to three or 400 in terms of the AQI scale. So do you have any ideas how that would correspond to a cigarette? So for example, when the air quality is really, really bad in, in Singapore, how many cigarettes does that correspond to smoking? That's one question. Any guesses? Does it correspond to, say, one cigarette a day, two cigarettes a day? Some people think it corresponds to a packet of cigarettes a day. In actual fact, it corresponds to, if the air quality in Singapore is extremely bad, the worst it ever is, it corresponds to about a quarter of one cigarette per day, okay, in the equivalent in terms of smoking. So it's actually not as bad, probably, as you think. In fact, I'll show you, grab it. I forgot to bring this out with me. This is actually a collection of PM, which I've got, and actually how much PM you would breathe 80 years. Okay, what's inside there, this little container. So if you live in Singapore, based on the levels of PM that we have for 80 years, you would breathe in this much PM over your lifetime. But what this also corresponds to, if you're a cigarette smoker, I hope no one here is, but if you are a cigarette smoker and you smoke one packet a day, which is what a lot of people seem to do, you will have this much in one month, okay? 
So it's a, a lot worse if you're a cigarette smoker. So one of the problems with the P, the, the P, sorry, the PM 2.5 or the PM 10 scale, the scale here, is that it doesn't take into account um, what the PM is made of. And that's a big problem because the PM in every country in the world is different, but everybody uses exactly the same scale. So it doesn't really make any sense. So for example, if the PM was all made of carbon, compared to if the PM was all made of lead, you'd still get exactly the same health effect according to the scale, but that's not correct. So one of the things we do is we actually measure the composition of the PM to find out what exactly it's made of. Well, this is actually some what are called scanning electron micrographs, images basically of what the PM looks like. Um, and you can see it's actually made of lots of different material. You have like crystalline material. These are, all this is actually, these particles are all smaller than 2.5 micron. More crystalline type material, um, pure compounds. You have this amorphous type material. You have this um, material here looks like plant material, possibly pollen. We also have other types of plant materials here. So it's a whole range of different materials. It's a very, very complex um, material. And every country in the world has different types of PM. So the example in Singapore, LPM actually has quite a high metal content. Whereas if you go to other countries such as China, they have much higher um, sulfate and nitrate um, in their PM. That's because they have a lot of agriculture. This is actually some data we've collected over years, um, about seven years. That just shows you how the PM changes over time. I'm sure you're aware of this type of information, but you see you get these large spikes now and then, and that's when we have the biomass burning from Sumatra. But also what you can see is always this, there's a constant background that exists all the time. And that's, what that actually indicates is that most of the PM that we're breathing in, or most of the pollution that we experience in Singapore does actually come from Singapore, okay? So it's not actually Indonesia that's polluting Singapore. We are polluting ourselves. There's a gap here. I think I might have run out of money at that time. And I had to stop my, briefly stop the research. Uh, this is actually how we collect the sample. For the, we have a, it's called a high volume sampler. And we put in these, it looks like a large, uh, oops, a sheet of paper. It's about the size of a piece of A4 paper. And it's actually a filter. It's made of silica. And we suck air inside this device and it's set up so it only collects particles of a certain size. In this case, um, 2.5 micron. So once the filter goes in, it's a nice white color, and then after usually a day, we take it out, it's this very dark color. And that's all the PM that's attached, all the PM in the air that what you're breathing in, what I have in that jar, basically, is attached to the filter. And then what we do is we, try and we have to analyze the material on the filter, and to do that, um, we use what's called a microwave digestion. So we take the filter, we cut it up into small pieces, we add concentrated acids, nitric and hydrochloric acid, and we stick it in this machine, in these, sorry, stick it in these carousels, which goes into this machine, which is essentially a microwave oven, but it's under high pressure, so everything's sealed up. And then by doing that, we can get the particles to dissolve, fully dissolve, and then it comes down, we do a filtration, dilution, and then we send it to this machine, which is called an inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, CPMS for short. And this machine is actually able to give us all the elements to analyze all the elements in the sample. It has a very hot plasma. Um, inside a plasma is a really hot flame, which is actually 10,000 degrees Celsius or 10,000 Kelvin. So it's close to the temperature of the surface of the sun. Very, very hot plasma. We have to have a very powerful flame to um, fan to vent the heat out. Otherwise, we'd burn the building down. OK, so in terms of what the elements we detect, uh, we detect some elements in the parts per million. These are higher levels, but still parts per million is one part every million. And we collect these types of elements, such as sodium, magnesium, quite common elements, um, boron, aluminium, etc. And then other elements we detect in the parts per billion. These are lower levels, things such as chromium, cobalt, nickel, copper, etc. Cadmium. So these are things that you're all breathing in inside you as you walk around. And then these ones we detect in lower levels, which are parts per billion levels. And again, uh, lots of different elements, but we have osmium, iridium. These are all very toxic. But again, we're detecting them in low levels, so there's nothing to worry about too much. Mercury, gold, 
that we detect pretty much everything you can detect, we can detect using this instrument. And to actually understand, though, uh, how dangerous this is, we look what's a lot called an enrichment factor. So the enrichment factor takes into account what you see compared to what you expect to see if the element was just coming from the crust, essentially as a crustal erosion source. So anything that's less than 10, based on this enrichment factor, means that it just comes from crustal sources. And then anything greater than 10 to 100 is what's called enriched. And then once you get above 100 to 1,000, it means it's really enriched, which is an extremely high. So these elements down here actually are surprisingly very, very high. So for example, we detect osmium 1,000 times higher than you expect to see. So it's quite unusual. We don't know why that is. <laughs> Osmin is a very rare element, so we're not sure why we're detecting so much, but it's quite consistent. I shouldn't say this doesn't mean that the concentration is really high. It just means that what we detect is higher than what you expect to see. So it's extremely high. Iridium is also very high. Um, there's a few things that are a bit high. Mercury, um, copper, but nothing that's too dangerously high, put it that way. But we can detect uh, a large number of different elements. Now, of course, this is only the elemental composition of the PM. The PM is also composed of organic material. And to measure the organic material, we have to do different types of measurements. But we, that's the other thing we also do. So with this research, it's done by a mixture of PhD students as well as honours students and Eureka and undergraduate students. So every year in my lab, I need to have lots of students because these measurements take a long time. So I certainly have room in my lab for people who are interested in learning how to do these measurements. It's very useful to collect uh, interesting data, as well as it teaches you how to use all these very sophisticated instruments, analytical instruments, which you then go on and use outside, if you go into jobs and industry, for example. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Prof. Webster, for sharing with us how chemistry can actually be used in our daily lives. So now that we have seen how actually chemistry can be applications in not just uh, research using the cutting edge technologies we have in CBC, next up, uh, joining us are our alumni, Dr. Stephen and Dr. Ashrifa, who will be sharing with us what life is like before graduating and also after graduation uh, in NTU. So. Uh, let us invite Dr. Ashifa, please. Thank you. So maybe just a quick one. This slide is uh, it summarizes basically uh, what I've done, and essentially what it summarizes here is that I am actually the product of NTU. Uh, so um, I actually spent my bachelor's um, in in uh, in NTU uh, in. Uh, uh, chemistry and biological chemistry, so it was the basic one that uh, Prof. Somot uh, mentioned about, with a concentration in medicinal chemistry. Spent about four years then, and then I pursued my PhD also in NTU. But that's uh, just that. On top of that, I had been able to actually undergo through um, exchange program in two universities uh, throughout my time in, in NTU. The first was actually in University of Ottawa, that's in Canada. And the second one's actually in Imperial College. Uh, that's where I actually did my final year project at. So it was really an interesting stint. Uh, it doesn't mean just uh, because I'm actually a full-time in NTU in Singapore, I'm not purely based there. You know, I did have to get, uh, um, I had the opportunity to also have some experience um, overseas and also to really understand the differences and the different standards um, there is out there. So really, if you were to ask me why did I choose uh, NTU, um, of course, uh, during my time, I was actually also offered um, uh, different different courses in, in, as well, uh, in different universities uh, in Singapore. So not many, so you know which one. Eh? So I actually also had to choose between NTU and the other. And I, uh, what I did was that I actually also attended the, the tea party event and there were also the tours. And what really got me really int uh, interested in NTU was actually the lab facilities. And if you haven't really seen, uh, you can see the older ones and uh, the one in the SPMS, I think, Wait, this started in 2005. I went in 2009. So it was just four years old, but I th the, the, the lab facilities are still really quite perfect now. Yeah, 2008, right? So it was really new. It was so uh, good. 
Um, so this is actually my, my niece. <laughs> if you see, she, she, this is exactly where the lab is. If you see the top right-hand corner, I don't know how to use this, but yeah. So this, um, and I think a lot now, now circuit breaker, sorry, no, now that's COVID. Um, you get the whole lab to yourself, right? More space, more lab space. Mm. Lesser, so much lesser, more space. <laughs> okay, again, I thought that's actually very important as a chemist and as a scientist. Uh, I thought that um, conducive learning is an important place, uh, it's an important thing, and um, the lab facilities is also important. So when you actually get access to really high, uh, high equipment, um, you get your own space to do your lab work, uh, all this actually really adds up to a really good and conducive environment for a scientist. Yeah, so um, also uh, approachable professors. I, in my first day, I entered NTU and I spoke to many professors and I thought that, hey, this is a really, really nice uh, environment for me to learn, for me to also uh, expand my network. So NTU was actually able to do that. And yes, it has lots of good food. Uh, you'll be very lucky now because the last time we only had really the old traditional canteen, you know. But now there's what, McDonald's, there's Subway, there's so many other things, la goodness. Yeah, it's still a lot of things for you to really explore. And I think all that adds up to a really good holistic education uh, yeah, environment, essentially. Uh, yes, it also, yeah, so I talk about holistic environment. I think what it does also is that NTU offers uh, a holistic education. So for me, um, I had been really lucky, as I told you in a shared earlier on, was that I spent two terms, basically. Uh, three months, no, no, was it four? Uh, okay, we see one term in uh, University of Ottawa. So I lived with a Canadian family right there, yeah. So these are some of my, uh, my course mate and uh, this is the Pakistani family. So you know, really get to expand my network and this is um, my colleagues in, in Imperial, uh, postdocs and postgrad. It was really interesting and there's a professor, physical chemistry professor in uh, University of Ottawa and also the network that I've managed, um, you know, friends I make, especially when during my overseas trip. Um, not just that, so uh, I'll share a little bit more not beyond undergrad is that I've also did my PhD. During my PhD, I also attended um, many events overseas to also present the, my findings. So this, this is actually one of the uh, conventions I attended in, in US. And this is, um, oh, this is actually a group of students in, uh, from, from NUS, uh, but at Sweden. So you see, the thing is that I, I, I thought um, as, as a, an undergrad, regardless where you go, I think it's really important for you to make sure that you open up yourself uh, to all these opportunities and jump on it, you know, where there is opportunity, go, go there, expand your network, and uh, join and participate in programs as far as possible. I think uh, the professors today and the way it's designed, the curriculum is designed, is much better than it was before. No, no, it's not like it was terrible then, but it's much better now, you know. You are so lucky, really, really, yes, uh, very, very lucky. Um, and besides uh, the overseas exchanges and, and, and you know, uh, all of that is that I think what's important is also uh, the co-curricular activities and the community service. So I have been able to do that uh, beyond just a scientist. I also um, had passion for the community and theatre. So this was actually one of which where we had collaborated with um, folks from NUS and we uh, were involved in theatre. So I thought it was really important and you know, to go out there and break the convention just because you're a scientist, you are terrible in arts. You're wrong, huh? So really, I thought what's important is that when, um, you know, when you're in, in, in a university, do also take some time to go beyond just education. You know, learn a little bit more about uh, what you're passionate about. So if you're serving with people, is, is that's what you like, go for it. You know, and there is actually opportunities for you to squeeze some time for you to do these things. Um, essentially, all of this keeps you uh, more human, right? You know, it's not just about education, but it's also education beyond that as well, right? So at the end of the day, when you go and apply for a job, people don't just look at your uh, cert, right? Cert is definitely one thing you need, but what makes you outstanding is, I think, personally, I feel that is the experience that you gain uh, during this entire time when you're in university, and as well as the network that you're actually able to establish during the time when you're also in university and beyond. So, uh, yeah, so again, these are uh, really just groups of friends um, that, that I uh, had been able to, and not, not, not all of them, uh, but essentially these are the, uh, the people that I worked with. These were my professors during my PhD. Um, this is Prof Lee Su Ying, and uh, yeah, so essentially these are a group of people that I thought um, are the friends that I've made. And um, I thought this feature is actually quite nice. Here, if you notice, they're all wearing different kaun. 
So I wanted to also highlight that, you see, during my time in NTU, I've also been able to, uh, you know, take courses that's beyond chemistry, right? So that, at that time, we call it the unrestricted electives. So I'm not sure if it's still the same thing. But it was during those times when I know there is uh, some business core modules and beyond that, which is also why I'm able to actually make friends who's just beyond chemistry. So, you know, she's the social scientist. Uh, you know, these are engineers. So really, it's just uh, a good place for you to network, build uh, friendship beyond just people within your division. So this is really uh, something that I thought I wanted to share. Uh, okay, so yes. What's another important thing is, of course, you say, okay, go university, right? Okay, there's this courses and everything. What else do you get out of this is that I thought the way the curriculum is designed right now is, is really good and it's such a way that it really helps to prepare yourself for the real world. Um, you know, last time during my time, when we do FYP, it was just between FYP or industrial internship. There were no either or, you know. But what happens is that I understand from Prof. Sumot is that uh, this time around, if you were to look at FYP, if you choose an FYP, you still have that 10 week stint in the industry. And I think that's important. And uh, it's good that actually, you know, uh, the, the way they design, the, they, we keep looking at rejigging the, the, the curriculum so that it's, it's actually more beneficial for uh, the undergrads. And I thought this is really Im something important. So, what I do essentially, if you notice, is that I give you an introduction of what I do, pure product of uh, NTU. But yes, so as a scientist, I'm a scientist by training. Uh, I specialize in medicinal chemistry. During my, uh, work, during my PhD, I essentially look at natural products and food chemistry essentially to treat metabolic disorders, so things like diabetes and obesity. But um, after the lab, I decided to actually take a conscious effort. Okay, sorry about that, but it's a bit messy. A conscious effort to leave the lab. So um, Prof Tan actually spoke about, uh, you know, just because you're a chemist undergrad doesn't mean that you know go out. You have to work. Into, you know you have to work in the lab. Um, that's actually uh, quite a stereotypical thing, but it's actually not real. Uh, I moved into the public research administration, so I worked under A star, uh, and I say worked huh, because um, right now I'm seconded also. So I'll, I'll share a little bit more just after that. Um, during my time as in the public research administ uh, administration in biomedical research council. Uh, I have been involved in, uh, very heavily involved in the drug discovery development ecosystem in Singapore. So uh, again, that's where the fundamental scientific knowledge is actually critical for me to understand and to meet various scientists, you know, and how do we actually really work very closely with scientists, just not just in ASTAR, you know, um, in NTU, in NUS, how can we actually work with them to make sure that the work that they do are, is translational enough and can actually bring money, huh? Prof, right? Yes, bring money. It's actually important. So if you realize, uh, A star actually the Ministry of Trade and Industry, not to MOE. Because ultimately, what we want is that the innovation and the scientific work that we do actually translate into economic outcome for the country. So um, this was something that I uh, am and was heavily involved in when I worked in A star. And it's also something that we don't learn in NTU, right? So there's only so much the university can prep you, no matter how amazing the curriculum is, I start, I start to realize that on-the-job experience is really important. Lah. So this is uh, really just my stint, and you know, in, during my time in ASTAR, I've had also the opportunity to go to different places, different universities, uh, you know, even in MIT, uh, this is University of Pennsylvania, I also go to farmers, uh, places like Merck, Pfizer, GSK, and this is exactly when you have the communication with them, you start to realize, you know, there's so much things that we can do uh, as scientists, and there's so many opportunities that we can uh, work with, like, in order to get something that's very translational in nature. So, yes, yeah, so as part of, as I told you, ASTAR reports to the Ministry of Trade and Industry. So, as part of the career development is that now I'm actually seconded. I'm a policy officer, a scientist by training, but actually look at your energy security to make sure that the lights are constantly on in this country. Yep. Okay, so that's what I do. Uh, and... Um, and yes, yeah, so beyond that, and, and as part of a policy officer, I also look at the COVID regulations to make sure that you're all wearing masks all properly and stuff like that. Huh? So essentially, these are some of the things that I do, a scientist by training, but we went beyond uh, things that I expected. But I think the key takeaway essentially is, is that, um, you know, while you, you are really, you know, just thinking about which is the university you want to go, what are the opportunities out there, you know, and I told you all the nice, amazing stories that I've had, 
all the successful stories, the co-founding of these things. Uh, but it isn't always rainbows and butterflies in science. Uh. We are more failures than expected. So you need we start to realize that we need to be mentally prepared to face these failures. And I would think that if a scientist, every failure is actually a success. It's one step towards success. Uh. So uh, yeah, so my last piece of advice is really just enjoy the journey, not just the destination. And uh, please choose the right university. I told you all the amazing things. So I don't know how else to convince you otherwise. Yeah, thank you. That was so inspirational and cool. Thank you, Dr. Ashifa, for your sharing. So as an undergraduate in NTUCBC, I can vouch that our lab is really first class, and the prof we have are really very warming people, and they are also very approachable. Yes. So now let us put our hands to invite Dr. Stephen uh, for his sharing. Yeah, uh, thank you. So I guess uh, all the speakers before me gave a very uh, nice uh, uh, picture of what are the opportunities in NTU, especially in chemistry. So I want to share some of my personal story that is not the butterfly and butter, uh, not the rainbow and the butterfly. So uh, when I look at you, right, um, it reminds me back in 2003 or 2004. So I wasn't invited to a tea party like you guys. I was invited to an interview. The reason why I was invited to an interview is because my grades wasn't good enough to enter chemistry. So I, I didn't really study that hard for A level. So uh, you know, end up I was in some sketchy area. So I, I came, uh, I was in NS then. Uh, I remember I was in one of the training. I took all time off for the interview. So I was like, asking the prof, like, you know, what, what kind of audience I'm expecting. So they are telling me that you guys are like the top tier students. So no doubt in your life, you'll be going to be successful. So uh, I'm, my sharing is more like, you know, why, what, what NTU gave me, you know, and why do I want to give back to NTU? So of course I have this interview, I managed to get in. And just nice, uh, at the end of first year, my dad went jobless. So um, there was some financial struggle that I had. So what is important and why I feel that has played a very important role in my life is because during that period, the faculty member actually extended help to me. So for example, uh, they arranged um, some part-time jobs that I can do. Uh, I will help out in the chemical store, so I took inventory and everything. So all this experience as an undergrad helped me in my real world. Um, so like, uh, I'm now a project manager, so sometimes I look dollars and cents. So some part of the, you know, the chemical store inventory uh, experience helped me with the dollar and cents. So I just want to bring across to you, yes, there are a lot of opportunity, but the school that you go into, the faculty that you have, and the support structure to help you with difficult time is also very important. And I can tell you firsthand, I got time in NTU, and this is the place where they helped me through this difficult time. And then again, and again, uh, you know, Paul Pao Xiang and, and some of the faculty members, they asked me to go career sharing you know, and, and stuff. So two weeks ago, I actually shared my career sharing if, with some of the undergraduates. I think you are in the call as well, right? Uh, so this is my, my um, way of giving because it has been such an instrumental period in my, in my life. So um, then maybe I just introduce a bit of myself because I taught a lot of what NTU is. So I, um, so I graduated in CBC, class of 2010, and then I graduated again, uh, 2014. So Dr. Shifa and uh, Prof. Lee, if I'm not wrong, they are actually my junior. <laughs> so I'm uh, so very old already. Uh, so now I'm in GSK. Um, so I joined GSK as a technical development chemist. Core is a chemist. Uh, then after, I moved on to a more project management role. So, you know, Shifa, that's how she showed a lot of Merck, GSK, right? So in this current role, I manage project uh, with, uh, with industry-related uh, research program. So I work with ASTAR and... So in fact, some of my prof now, every monthly, they have to give a project update to me. <laughs> So it's interesting how life uh, became, right? So, um, so and I, the chemistry is my so Beyond that, right, I also got the opportunity to learn machine learning. Uh, I got my hands dirty in biofarm, the big bio side of things. I also went in 
circuit chain optimization as well as QC lab scheduling optimization. You see, I do not have training in, in, chem, in, in all this area, like supply chain and all these things, but my core is chemistry. It enables me to think logically, uh, understand what's the pain point, and uh, look for solution. As a scientist, I always look for solution. And when I look at potential collaborators, I look at whether they can provide solutions. And, and all this training that I have in, in NTU, CBC, has enabled me to move now, quite well, I think. <laughs> yeah. So I hope you, know, you guys are here. I believe you guys are interested in chemistry. And I'm not going to tell you like, you should do chemistry or not. But because you are interested in chemistry, and I think that your life is going to evolve after you graduate, you will move out of chemistry eventually, some of you. Uh, so it's important to do what you like, because that is your core. And your core will help you to develop other skill sets in life, and I just hope that you guys have a very memorable undergraduate time, like I do. And uh, that's all for my sharing. Yep. Thank you, Dr. Stephen, for the insightful sharing. So now, let us move on to our Q&A segment. So if you guys have any question, uh, regarding our curriculum or student life, feel free to drop it uh, in the slido below. Yes. So uh, may we provide Dr. Uh, Sumon and Dr. Tan and also our alumni, Dr. Stephen and Dr. Ashifa, for the Q&A section. So the first question that we have is, what are some of the internship opportunities available for CBC student? Yeah, um, I think I mentioned during my presentation, there are two opportunities that are mainly there. One is the professional attachment opportunity, which is a 10-week internship. Uh, that is available to you if you are planning to do, in your final year, uh, a research project, a final year research project. So if you're doing a final year research project, then in your, typically in your second year or third year around there, you get to do a 10 week professional uh, attachment, right? It's a short one. Uh, of course, the other option is the option where in your final year, you do the long professional attachment, which is around 20 weeks long, right? Uh, so these are the two options. There is another third option, which I mentioned briefly in my presentation, is that you can also choose to do what we call our cooperative education program, whereby uh, if you are in that, but that's a very selective program, but if you're selected for that cooperative education program, you actually get to do uh, a total of 50 weeks of industrial attachment uh, in the same company throughout your uh, four years of stay with us in CBC. So how it works is that, like I showed, you do short stints between, uh, so every, every academic year, between the academic years, you have a short break, which comes around roughly around June, July. So you can do research attachments during that time, uh, between your first year and second year, between your second year and third year, and then a longer stint in your final year. So the cooperative education program gives you, in the same company, the possibility of doing a long stint of 50 weeks. So there are three opportunities available. And uh, the career attachment office in NTU basically helps you to link you up with companies to get you the internship positions. But if you, are, uh, if you ha know someone in a particular company and they are ready to offer you internship, you can self-source an internship too. You, know, you can go out, look, and talk to companies and say, hey, I'm an NTU student and I want to do this short internship with you. And most companies are welcome, uh, I mean, welcome t uh, students doing this. So th those are the internship opportunities we have. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just want to ask one question. Uh, so have chemistry students done internship outside chemistry? Yeah, I mean, uh, because the internship is part of our curriculum, we cannot allow students to do it too far away from chemistry, right? Because it's part of our academic curriculum. So, uh, but, you know, there are uh, cases where you do internship uh, where your chemistry, core chemistry skill is used, but you use it in a different way. For example, uh, in, in nowadays, see, there are a lot of companies doing uh, data science, for example. So if they want to do a applied data science project, but they want to use your chemistry knowledge, your chemical knowledge, or something in like patent, right? So this kind of related fields, yes, you can. Yeah, so uh, as Sumat mentioned, the, we have internship students doing like patent law, for example. Um, and also the more kind of like chemistry related, but not quite chemistry, like I have students doing, you know, con in consultancy company, right? Basically, their company specializes in fighting lawsuits uh, against or for chemical companies, things like that. Uh, what else? Uh, like fragrance company. You know, you may not think that fragrance has anything to do with chemistry, but they are all molecules. So, for example, like uh, Givaudan, all these major flavor and taste company, like your Milo, all those tastes, right, are actually made by all these company. They also hire chemistry and also have an internship, for example. Next question, I guess. Um, how is hall life? I guess that one I cannot answer. Sumo cannot answer. But Stephen, I'm you, sure you never stay. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, what I can tell you guys is that the hall life that Stephen and Azifa had is very different from the hall life that you guys are going to experience, because the halls now in NTU, if you have been to the NTU campus, they almost look like condominiums. But the, the room rates are not that high, so don't worry about that, especially the path, okay? Uh, but the facilities have improved leaps and bounds, and the hall life is now a luxury life. So compared to the kind of life I had in halls and hostels, it's luxury life, so don't worry about it. Uh, yeah. Lots of good food, <laughs> plenty of facilities, gyms in the hall, whatnot. Uh, I, I, I really cannot comment, but uh, based on my observation, uh, all my peers who stay in hall, they really enjoy their hall life. So, yeah, <laughs> that's uh, based on empirical observation. But I guess uh, sometimes this question may not be so valid anymore because it's really unknown. I mean, because of COVID, a lot of uh, hall life activities have to be curtailed. And really don't know, even post-COVID, whether things will change. So this question should be an open question, actually. Not so easy to answer. So we'll move on to the next question. Um, bio, bio versus chemistry. Uh, maybe Sumat, you want to answer? Um, yeah. Uh, so there are two parts of this question, I believe. So let me answer the second part. Will I be at a disadvantage if I did not take bio in JC? No, you won't be. Uh, because our curriculum is designed in such a way, like I mentioned briefly during my presentation, it's designed in such a way that in your first year, you do cover again the basics of biochemistry, right? That uh, over and beyond what you had in JC, but also it overlaps a little bit. So I even if you did not take bio in, in JC, you, are, you will not have an issue at all because we do cover that. Uh, regarding the second part of the question, uh, the boundary between bio and chemistry is actually very vague if you come to think about it because uh, a lot of the biological processes, for example, involves basically chemistry, mo molecules of chemistry and the, actually the, the way they behave. Uh, so curriculum-wise, uh, I would say it's, if you look at traditional way of demarcating chemistry and biology, it's still majority of chemistry, but the bio component is significant and it is there in certain courses which are specifically bio-themed but it's also there in regular chemistry courses where, you know, when you learn organic chemistry, for example, you learn a little bit of biochemistry, right? You learn physical chemistry, for example, you learn about enzyme kinetics, right? So it's the, the demarcation is not very clear, but we make sure that those who graduate from our four-year program, they have a good foundation in biochemistry and a strong foundation in the chemistry aspect. Yes. I'll, I'll just add a, a little bit. Of course, when you talk about chemistry, biology, these are like kind of traditional 
it's from historical background that we have all these demarcation of different uh, specialization. But of course, now in the 21st century, a lot of problems have been solved in a multi facet way. Um, that, that being one. The other thing is the biology that is being taught in chemistry are taught by chemists. So we are approaching biology, very importantly, from the molecular, from the chemical point of view. Okay, so it's very different from the biology, from a biologist's point of view. So, I mean, to, to summarize, it's actually we, we look from the bottom-up approach. We start from the molecules and work our way up. Whereas, whereas the biologists probably look at the animals or plants first and come down. So that's this uh, difference in the approach. So we, although we say it's biology, chemistry, biology, it's really from the molecular approach that's the more important thing for us. Uh, I think maybe we can take some question from here because we keep, keep, keep answering this question. Is there any burning questions here from the audience that is not similar to what is asked here? We can take a question. No? Okay, good question, but Sumat will yeah. be there. Yeah, all right. So, so um, no, no, it's okay. I, I get the question. Yeah, I get the question. Oh, oh okay. So in, in case the others did not hear, the question is, uh, uh, what is the difference between doing a minor, which uh, provides more flexibility because you can do a minor in any area offered by NTU, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, doing a second major, right, in a specific area? So uh, the, the difference lies in the depth in which you go into this field. So if you are doing a minor, and like I mentioned, for example, if you're doing the chemistry program, you can do a minor in, I don't know, you can do a minor in psychology, for example. You can do a minor in education. So the, the variety of minors available is extremely large which basically is any course offered by, any program offered by NTU, you can do a minor in, right, while you're doing. So it doesn't necessarily need to be science related even. Uh, so the variety is of course more, but for a minor to fulfill the requirements of a minor, you need to take only a very few number of courses. So the depth is not there. Uh, but if you're doing a second major, that is uh, an a situation where you are going to choose an area of second major where you are going to go much deeper into that field. So for example, environmental science, food science, or our international trading program, you go really in depth. You take a significant number of courses in that field and it's deeper. So with regards to your answer of which do I choose, it's not an easy thing. You're spoiled for choices. Like the time when Asifa and uh, I believe Stephen did, we only had one program. Things were much simpler for them. <laughs> but we have spoiled the scene for you guys, right? We have given you more choices. Uh, so it's up to you. Uh, do you. Are you really passionate about one of the second major areas? I recommend you go and do the second major. Uh, you are not and you have a few, uh, I mean, non-science related area which you have in mind, you are passionate about. For example, some of our students go and take a second minor, uh, sec, I mean, uh, uh, it's, it, it take a mi uh, minor in uh, languages, for example. That might help them future in the future, right? So, yeah. Is it possible to specialize in medicinal uh, and all? Oh, the red yeah. one. Yeah. Okay. What are some of the lab skills that students will be equipped with during their time in CBC, in chemistry? Will students be exposed to the use of analytical instruments like ICP, GC, LC, and how will students be accessed for their lab competency? Okay. <laughs> right. Seems like most of the questions <laughs> I have to feed. Uh, so, with regards to lab skills, you start uh, right from the first year. Many of your first year courses, for example, has a lab component. So there are two kinds of exposure you get, uh, actually more than two, kind of exposure that you get to lab. One is as part certain courses will have a lab component. So you learn the theory, 
and then you apply that theory to the laboratory part of the course. There are other cores which are standalone lab courses, which typically you take in the year two or year three, where you do only the lab, and it's intensive lab training. Some of the lab sessions are like six hours long, and you do intensive lab training, right? Uh, besides all these uh, structured lab experience, you also get the opportunity to do real life, real lab experience during your summer research and your final year project. So there's a wide range of opportunities during your four years uh, when you get exposed to the very latest techniques and the very latest lab equipments. So none of our equipments, we consider them as a holy cow because we open it up to, even the most expensive of our equipment is actually opened up to undergraduates to really do hands-on training. For example, some of you may know that there is a, you know the MRI that is used by doctors to analyze brain, do brain scans and stuff like that. We have the chemistry equivalent of that, which is called an NMR, and each NMR roughly costs about the cost of a Ferrari, right? But we don't, we don't worry about that because we let our students do hands-on training on an NMR machine. So all the cutting it, it so even the equipments that Professor Webster mentioned earlier, the ICP mass and all those stuff, all these you get hands-on training during your stay, either as part of uh, your course and the curriculum lab part, or as part of your summer research and final year project. So laboratory training is actually one of our strengths. And that is the reason why we actually, we were one of the pioneers in Singapore in starting this summer research program, which allow you to directly jump into real world research right after your first year, right? You can do it right after your first year and you can choose different fields during different stints of summer research. So first summer research, you can do biochem. Second, you can do physical chemistry, spectroscopy. So lab training is really, really uh, incorporated into the curriculum and you'll get plenty of opportunities. Yeah. As, uh, yeah. Okay, is it possible to specialize in medicinal, pharmaceutical, chemistry? Uh, we don't have a specialization per se in these two areas, but uh, if you saw during my presentation, I uh, mentioned some of the prescribed electives. Uh, so a lot of those prescribed electives actually are related to these areas of medicinal chemistry and pharmaceutical chemistry. and all the core courses that you take in chemistry are anyway relevant. So if you're learning organic chemistry, advanced organic chemistry, yes, that is relevant to medicinal chemistry. So you don't have a specialization per se, but medicinal chemistry and ph pharmaceutical chemistry and all the components that it uh, involves are actually incorporated into many of our courses. And of course, you get to do research in, like you saw the slide on Professor Chiba, who does research on medicinal molecules. So you can do uh, research stints with research groups which are working in the field. So in that way, although there is no specialization, you get significant amount of training in medicinal and pharmaceutical chemistry, which is why we have people like our good friend Steven here, who has been hired by one of the world's top pharmaceutical companies, GSK. Right. Uh, Steven, do you want to elaborate on that part? So I know there are courses out there to teach you pharmaceutical chemistry, but uh, when you go to industry, especially in pharmaceutical, uh, a lot of problems you face is actually based on experience. Um, I believe, uh, based on my observation and based on my experience, uh, undergraduate courses will prepare adequately for you to understand the chemical reactions that the process is running, but a lot of troubleshooting are manufacturing related. So that needs a lot of experience uh, in the industry itself. So uh, rest assured, uh, this course prepare you adequately for the industry. Yep. Um, so for mine, I, I actually specialize in um, medicinal chemistry. Uh, how I did this was this one, during my final year project, I did it in Imperial College London, um, which is where I was first exposed to medicinal chemistry, the actual lead optimization. So how, as an organic chemist, we can try to constantly, we call it lead optimization. So 
we alter the uh, molecules to make sure that it is more bioactive. So there are actually many platforms, although not very official. Um, I graduated and even my PhD is also specialized in medicinal chemistry because of the links and the networks that the professors actually have with the other universities. Yeah. So it's quite possible. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, I think, <laughs> how saying, do you want to take that question or you want me to? So uh, let me read out a question, right? Is it true that chemistry plus second major program, such as food science, etc., are extremely intensive academically? Have students who have taken second majors been able to cope well with research projects? Internship hall life. I mean, this doesn't really just apply to second major, actually. It applies to all, even if you're on a single program. It doesn't mean that a single program is... It's only a slightly lesser demand in your academic... Uh, if you look at the AU, it's almost the same, all right? So in a sense, the number one thing that you have learned in university is time management. The second thing that you need to learn is time management. And the third thing is also time management. It's basically the most important thing. So to answer that, I'm not really answering the question. It's, it's people, different people have different ways of time managing. Some people can cramp things. Some people need to spread things out. So these are the things that students should be thinking about. But from anecdotal uh, experience, those that go for the second major, we, they are not anybody, right? There's only selective few. And we view that they are academically strong enough that they should be able to handle it. Um, so and the second major people that we talk to, I think most of them are doing okay. So they balance things, uh, you know, they could balance things. Bit, and by and large, they, they, they are faring pretty well. So that's all I can say. And none of them here has any experience. To, no, no second major, right, obviously. That, that time, no such thing. Um, so I guess that, that's the answer that I have. Oh, or maybe we have some student... Do you want to help answer? Because you are the most qualified one since, since you've got a second major right now. Is it you? Oh, who huh? I remembered wrongly. Sorry, sorry cannot provide any further answer. All right, um, maybe I should open and see whether, they, because we keep taking, taking questions from the, uh, from, the, from the on. Oh, okay, we'll reserve the last question for you guys, because I'm, uh, I see there's a last question. Any last questions? No? Yes, sir. Vale, vale. Uh, okay, so do you get like a advantage in terms of job opportunities if you take a minor along with your main course? Is do you get an uh, advantage? Yeah. Um, I think it really depends on the job the, uh, that you are re applying, right? Really, I guess if it's, um, for example, like if you, uh, some people take um, chemistry, my, a lot of very popular is like with like entrepreneurship or business, then probably if it's a company that really need a small like um, small SME or something who also need chemistry expertise and also need some finance skills, yeah, then your minor may come into play. So I, I would say that yes, there must be some advantages, but it really depends on the job that you're applying. Um, I guess in the end, this minor thing is not just a practical thing, it's also to fulfill your interest. So maybe from that way, that approach, that should be the number one reason why you want to choose minor. Um, then the practicality, because things are so much in the flux, you really don't know how, how to place your bet. Do you want to add something to that? Yeah, I, I think that's pretty much sums it up. You know, okay. it's, it's, it's a minor is the depth is not there, but if you go into a specific field in which the the employer looks at your minor and they are interested in that particular skill for your future job, that it can come to your advantage. Yes. So, um, well, since nobody's stopping me, so I'm going to answer one more question. <laughs> Is it true that we need, uh, you need a PhD for a career in chemistry? I think that may be some of the question that you guys being, you know, the, uh, having good grades may be thinking about. So I think it's a relevant question since we've got people here to answer questions as well. Um, is it, it again, again, as I'll say it depends. Let's say I can speak for myself because I'm in a, 
university environment, I teach chemistry, I do research. If you want to do, have a career in research in fundamental chemistry, then a PhD is a, almost a requirement. Okay, uh, if you want to teach in a university, yes, it's a, uh, it's a requirement. But of course, there's a huge slew of chemistry jobs out there, and some may not really require a PhD. In fact, like um, I think Stephen will say that having a PhD is good, but that is not the deal breaker because experience, work experience, and EQ is very important. Right? So you guys want to add more? Yeah, so I think the definition of a chemistry career, we need to broaden the definition. Chemistry career doesn't relate just to research. I believe uh, when you ask this question, you have a research in mind. So if you want to be, you want to build a career in research, yes, I believe a PhD is uh, entry level. Um, but not necessarily all people who do research need a PhD. It depends on what kind of level you want to get to uh, and what you define success in life. A lot of other jobs out there in chemistry related, uh, for example, manufacturing, uh, you do not really need a PhD. But of course, a PhD gives you a certain advantage uh, in, over the long course of your career, but it's not a deal breaker. Yeah. yeah, so just to add on, so what it does is that when you do a PhD, it actually specializes you in a specific field, which also then narrows down your opportunity with everything else, right? So what happens is that, so typically I do have colleagues and friends um, okay, so in, in the chemistry, public administration, and um, most of them are actually not PhD, but, you know, their scientific knowledge, basic chemistry knowledge, fundamentals, has actually been useful. Uh, it helps them in analysis and analytical stuff. I do have course mates who graduated with uh, just the bachelor's in working in forensic science in HSA, you know, and also doing really, really well on those things. Uh, so so there, there are many opportunities uh, without a PhD. Uh, so, yeah, there is the advantage and the disadvantage. So, you know, um, personally for me is that when I graduated with a PhD and I realized that I didn't want to pursue um, lab work, I, I did struggle to find a job because then they, th they say that you're too specialized, you know, you are too uh, highly qualified in a particular field. <laughs> Would you be willing to be more open? Yeah, so, which is, yeah, good and bad. Yeah, yeah I, I usually tell st uh, people thinking about doing a PhD, it's really not for aiming for a career. It's a really, if you do a PhD because you're interested in it, you're interested in molecules. That's why you do a PhD in chemistry or whatever particular subfield you're, you're in. So interest and passion should be the one that drives your decision, not so much the career. Um, I think we can, yeah, so I guess we can kind of like, I think, let us just briefly run through the remaining questions. Oh, okay, sure, sure. Let's do that. Uh, are the modules more applicable, uh, uh, more application-based or uh, theory-based? Again, we like to use depends. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, there, there are, like, like I mentioned earlier, there are some modules where you only learn the theory, you have tutorials and you have lectures. There are other modules where you have a lab component incorporated. There are other modules which are purely lab, Basically, the idea is that uh, whatever theory you learned, uh, either as part of its incorporated lab or as a separate lab, you do get an opportunity to see the theory in operation in the lab, right? So, yeah. yeah. Uh, is it possible for me to enter the food science program even though I am offered chemistry so far? Yes. Actually, for the food science program, the second major, uh, you do have an opportunity to apply to join the food science program after your first year. This is specific only for the food science second major, right? So yes, the answer is yes, but not for the other second majors, only for the food science program. So next question, are there any technical skills I'm expected to develop during my time here in CBC, um, technical skills. Yeah, uh, you, you, you're expected so to develop good technical skills in yeah. the field of chemical science, which yeah. again, like I emphasized, is incorporated into our curriculum. We make sure that you do develop those technical skills. Of course, which there's, are, also, yeah, yeah. there's also other soft skills that, of course, Sumat uh, mentioned, right? The, the transferable skill, how to make presentations, how to you know, write out a resume, all these things would also be part of the education. So I guess, next question, when can we apply for overseas exchange program and if it's <laughs> different from JAM and overseas internship? So this is a very 
forward-looking, optimistic question. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, usually majority of our students go for the overseas stint uh, in their third year. right? So that is typically a good time to go for that. It's, you don't want to go to an overseas exchange program too early because you want to make sure that you have your foot planted well in the curriculum, handling the courses properly. So most of our students go for these programs in the third year. So you have various options. You can go for a very short stint, or you can go for a semester long stint, like the one that Asifa did. Uh, so you have various, so you can check on the website. There are various options available. And some of these allow you to transfer the credits for the courses that you read in the overseas partner universities or to satisfy the AU requirements that you have for the NTU program. Yep. OK. Um, unfortunately, I think we have be to, to like, um, end the event. Um, it, are the MC going to say something? Yeah. So thank you very much. I, but I think we will still be around. Um, and we'll be, you know, we'll feel free to come and ask us some questions or to just chat or just, like, you know, whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this, yeah. uh, thank you, professors and uh, fellow alumni. Yeah. So uh, that is all we have for today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, and we hope that you have gained some insightful, uh, insightful uh, insights. Uh, so as we come to the end of the session, do help us uh, by scanning the QR code to complete uh, the feedback form uh, for today's program. Yeah. Uh, for those uh, physical students that are here today, uh, we actually have a breakout rooms so you can uh, mingle with the professors and ask them anything uh, you like yeah so uh, i believe that when you guys uh, came in you were assigned to different groups like uh, c1 c2 yeah so um for the people who are in uh, c1 can if you're interested to mingle with the professors um you can come to this corner yeah um oh yeah uh, so, uh, just a gentle reminder before we go to the breakout rooms that the last shuttle bus will leave at 3.50 p.m. Um, yeah, so um, for the students in C1, um, could you gather in this corner? Yeah.